Um, all right, welcome everyone. Um, first, I'll just start with some housekeeping. This event is being recorded and will be made available through the NEST Climate Systems Hub. My name is Sugat Nasi and I'm a climate scientist at the Australian Bureau of Meteorology. Um, I'd like to begin by first acknowledging traditional custodians of country from where I'm dialing in from the land of the Wadarong people, uh, but also throughout Australia. I acknowledge their continuing connection to land, sea and community and pay my respects to elders both past, present and emerging. Today we will be discussing climate change storylines, a term with um, a specific meaning in Western science, which we'll hear more about from Ted. However, I want to acknowledge that the term storyline also potentially has meaning in the realm of indigenous traditional knowledge. And we have much to learn from indigenous cultures about living in a sustainable way on this land. So I hope we can keep that um, context for today's discussion and in our scientific work in future. This event is jointly organized through the NEST Climate Systems Hub and the WCRP My Climate Risk Lighthouse activity. I'll um, just say a couple of words on that. The NEST Climate Systems Hub provides research through BOM, CSIRO and the university partners to advance the understanding of Australia's climate, its extremes and its associated drivers. This research will directly inform climate adaptation solutions for Australia. Um, WCRP has five new activities that aim to uh, aim to make critical near-term progress towards meeting WCRP's vision, mission and scientific objectives. The My Climate Risk Lighthouse activity is one of these, and it aims to develop and mainstream a bottom-up approach to regional climate risk, which starts with the requirements of decision makers. This event is the first organised by the Australian Regional Hub of the activity, and I'd like to acknowledge my co-organisers in this activity, uh, Michael Gross and Andrew King, who I think are on the line. Um, so for more info and to get involved, uh, please do get in touch with uh, any of us three. And without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker uh, today is um, Professor Ted Shepard. Ted is the Grantham Professor at the University of Reading, and he's had a distinguished career in climate science, making important contributions on topics including the role of ozone in the client, climate and the importance of atmospheric dynamics in understanding regional climate change. Ted is the co-lead of the My Climate Risk Lighthouse activity and will talk to us today about his pioneering work in making climate change information more useful through a storylines approach, a concept that he has helped popularize over recent years. So please feel free to put your questions and comments in the chat and hopefully we'll have some time at the end for Q&A and um, thank you very much, Ted, for dialing in at this ungodly hour for you. Um, over to you, maybe you could try sharing your screen. Yeah. Oops, no, uh, can you see it now? Yeah. Is that working? Okay. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity to, to be speaking to you about uh, what's now my favorite topic, I think, storylines. Um, I'll just quickly jump to the heart of the matter. This is, in a way, the summary of the essence of it, uh, and then we'll uh, unpack this through, through, the, through the talk. Climate risk involves, tr traditionally, we, uh, three aspects. One is the uh, internal vari variability, chaos in, in the climate system, which determines the extreme weather and climate events. Then there's the changes in the possible weather and climate states. If we think of climate as being the entire, uh, what a mathematician would call a probability di di distribution or just the set of all possible weather states. If we think of that as climate, then the change in those possible weather states is climate change. And then we've got, of course, the human managed aspects of vulnerability and exposure. So those are the three elements. <clears throat> But only the first of these is su subject to what's uh, to a traditional probabilistic treatment. And by probabilistic in this a traditional sense, I mean what's called frequentist or aleatoric. That, that word, that's a word meaning a chance-based pr process as it's a likelihood, a, 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 a return period, that, that kind of thing. You can only apply that to the internal variability. There's, there's no concept of a return period for climate change I I itself. Um, and even then, it's, it's going to be quite uh, uncertain for the most extreme events. The, the second, the change in the possible weather and climate saints is subject to what's called epistemic uncertainty or uncertainty in knowledge or systematic uh, 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 uncertainty. That's even for a given climate forcing. Of course, there's uncertainty in the climate forcing, but uh, even for a given climate forcing, there's uh, uh, uncertainty in the response. And the third, a, a, which is not subject to a frequentist uh, approach. And the third, the human managed aspect is also uncertain. Plus, um, we also have to cast it really in the decision space to be useful. So ultimately, pr probability 
um, from a theoretical po point of view is degree of be belief, and it can also be defined as pro proclivity to action, and hence is su subjective fundamentally. So our challenge as scientists is to develop a scientific language for meaningfully representing and communicating this complex web of uncertainty. We need to combine um, uh, multiple lines of uh, evidence for models and observations and extend into the decision space. Now, uh, it, sometimes, uh, so storylines are related to narratives and you might ask, can a narrative provide scientific, scientific evidence for Decision making, and I think the answer is clearly yes. This is a um, apocryphal story because the source is not considered uh, a reliable source. Now, uh, uh, two two years ago, almost when COVID was really taking off, there was supposedly a conversation that took place uh, in the in the government of the this country where I am now. Um, Boris Johnson, who's the prime minister, his advisors were saying we have to meet and have an emergency meeting and discuss what's going to happen about coronavirus. And he said, no, I can't do that. I'm going to see the Queen. That's what I, assume, that, that's what I do every Wednesday. Saw it. I'm going to go and see her. And then the, his advisor apparently said, you can't go and see the Queen. What if you go and you give her coronavirus? And apparently he said, you're right. I can't go. So that's that's a narrative. No, no probability there. No, no uh, quantification. Um, but it was a it was a compelling argument. I think it was a good argument to, if it was true or not. Now there is an element about statistics which I will touch on. I don't really want want to get get into. I have have a whole, whole other talk on that. But I do have to mention it. There's been a, a long um, uh, a, a appeals to get rid of the concept of statistical si si significance. This is an, uh, a Nature editorial from 2019, so three, three years ago. There have been many, many papers on this, of course, and this is probably the highest level appeal to get rid of statistical significance. They, they say in their strap line, um, doing this would make science harder, but bet better. And a, an obvious point that, they, that is talked about in, in the accompanying material is that um, the idea that the uh, a p-value less than 0.05 or some other number should not be interpreted as true-false in uh, a dichotomous sense. But the issue runs much deeper than this. And for climate change science, especially, uh, the science is clearly anchored in physical understanding, yet the frequent statistical practices absolutely dominate published cl climate change science. Uh, there are exceptions, but I think it's a fair statement that they absolutely dominate and they continue to do so. And this creates a disconnect between physical reasoning and statistical practice, and I have um, a, a paper, it's an essay, really came out of a, a, an interdisciplinary workshop that came out in, in climatic change in, in the autumn. Well, one of the aspects is causality, and uh, uh, there's been a, a, a revolution going on in statistical practice on, under ca causal statistics, and Judea Pearl, the AI guru at UCLA, is one of the leaders of that. Uh, he's got some very technical books, but this book within him, McKenzie is a popular book, which I really, really recommend is highly readable. And he makes clear that uh, a causality, and it's true, you simply don't find the word causality if, if you look in the classic textbooks in, a, in our field. But uh, understanding ca causality is crucial for setting up statistical analysis and interpreting the, the, the results. The point is that the mathematics is agnostic, but the physical and about causality, but the physical interpretation is not. So here's a classic, uh, a simple kind of example, um, and Pearl talks about examples like this and more complex ones. So we have two, two, uh, two variables, x and, um, x and z, both of which are assumed to affect y in some way. So typically, if you do, if you do a, a linear re regression, you would regress um, uh, y against uh, uh, the, the predicted variable against the explanatory variables x and z. And if, if you do that, you get the equation. I hope you can see, see my pointer. So y at a, any data point is then a, 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 a linear combination of, of, um, of, of, a, of beta, um, y, x, comma, z. This is just a coefficient times x and, and also a beta uh, times z. Those are the regression coefficients plus noise. And if you correlate, if you correlate y with x, r subscript y x, you get two terms, and you can easily see if you just apply uh, in this equation a simple algebra that the correlation of y with with, with x 
has two terms. It's got the regression coefficient of, of uh, y on x, this term here, which is the direct effect, but then it's got a second term, which it, you can see represents this indirect pathway. And it's the, the, the regression of y against z times the correlation of z with, with x. But at this point, I haven't drawn any any arrows. And uh, if the error, if if the causality, this is by by the way a special case, so it's known as the path tracing rule. Um, if the causality runs from x to z, then you would think of z as being a mediating factor. Um, but if the causality runs from z to x, uh, z is rather a confounding factor. And how you interpret this this data and the correlation depends entirely on whether it's a confounder or, or a mediator, but the math is agnostic about that. Just to give an example, uh, oh, sorry, click too quickly, um, is a paper, there's the, I refer to a paper led by Mar Marlene Kretschmer at, at Reading and colleagues, um, uh, which just, just came out in BAMS, which, which, which talks about all this in the context of te teleconnections. It's a pedagogical paper. So here, here's one of our examples that will be familiar to you. It's the variability of the Southern Hemisphere mid-latitude jet in early Austral summer, October, November, uh, de de December. That's known to be correlated with, with ENSO. In the case of the ENSO pre-analysis that we used here, the correlation is, point, is minus 0.14. But it's also known that the jet's affected by variability in the seasonal breakdown of the stratospheric polar vortex. So you can think of both the vortex and ENSO as having an effect on the jet. And we know that the causality runs from ENSO to the vortex, not the other way around. Um, so if, if you regress jet against ENSO, ENSO and vortex, you find that the direct effect is only minus 0.04. And then there's a 0.39 uh, effect, which is a, a comparatively large effect of the vortex breakdown on, on the jet. And then the, 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 there's a correlation between ENSO and vortex, which we interpret causally as ENSO affecting vortex for lots of physical reasons. And so the, the, the correlation between jet and ENSO, which is minus 0.14, is, is accounted for by the sum is this is just the path tracing rule that I wrote down before of minus 0.04 and then 0.39 times minus 0.26. So this just goes to show this is a case of the mediating uh, effect. And I know that you're uh, interested in MLR at the Bureau. And I, I must say, um, I was trained as a physicist and I always ha had the impression that MLR was well, what you did when you got desperate and couldn't think of anything else. But after having read Pearl's book, I have to say it's a it's a beautiful method. It's really powerful and we really underestimate it. I think it's got great value. One of the things is it provides a built-in narrative. You've got an explanation right there about a direct pathway and an indirect pathway. And then you can, it. by the way, this is linear, but it generalizes naturally to conditional probability. So you can so nonlinear versions of this are perfectly natural. And it can also be used to construct storylines, for example, how ozone uh, uh, depletion affects the vortex and so on. All right, well, let me uh, get back to climate change um, and start with the idea that the usual narratives around climate change, if you hear uh, people discussing a, a extreme events or so on, it's pretty much always based on thermodynamics. But if you, and for temperature, that's of course not, not a bad argument. But uh, for a precipitation, it's it's not so clear. And for many in many regions, precipitation seems to be controlled much more. And I'm speaking about longer term, not just extreme uh, uh, precipitation, but longer term anomalies. It's controlled much more by atmospheric circulation, which is the wind patterns, than by th thermodynamics. Thermodynamics being that warmer air holds more moisture. So this is an example from Clara Desert's work from a decade ago. So this is really, really the first of the set of large ensembles, um, initial condition ensembles with, with the NCAR model at the time. So what's plotted here are empirical P PDFs, probability density functions of wintertime trends over a 55 year period, 2005 to 2060 in the Eurasian North Atlantic sector, relevant to, to where I live. And in each case, we have the control run, which is shown in gray here. So you have a distribution, which is centered around zero, apart from noise. You can see in all three cases, it's around zero. And then the red is the um, width, is the, is the distribution with climate change. Let's look first at the right. This is standard surface air temperature. And you see that um, indeed the, 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 the control run, there, there, there could be a warming trend or a cooling trend. Um, you, you can get either one because of, of just chance. 
uh, processes, uh, but it's a, but it's centered around zero, and you can see that the climate change is really well separated. This is three and a half st standard deviations uh, uh, of the control. So even a single real realization, as we would get in the real system, it'll be clear what cli the climate change affects um, air temperature. But if you look at sea level pressure on the left, which is a measure of atmospheric circulation, you can see it's a very di di different story. There is a clear effect of climate change here. Here, it's a decrease of sea, uh, sea level pressure. But you see that the change is only about one, one standard de de deviation. And it, this would not be de detectable in a single realization. If you look at precipitation in the middle, apart from the flip and sign, you can see it looks a lot more like sea level pressure on the left than it looks like the surface air temperature on the right. It means we have an undetectable, if at least if this model is correct, we have an uh, un, uh, undetectable uh, effect from a single realization. Yet you see that the change in risk is not small um, because if you look not even in the extreme tails here, but just on the shoulders, you see that the change in likelihood has changed by about a factor of two. So you've got a, a, a change in risk that isn't small, but a very small signal to noise ratio. This is the nature uh, of our challenge. And uh, to, to make it worse, the models, climate models can disagree on the nature of the atmospheric circulation response to global warming. This is, is an example, again, from the North, North Atlantic sector, um, winter time. Um, from a, this, this is from a paper of mine a few years back showing the models at the time. The climatology is in gray, and th this is the um, 850 hectopascal or lower troposphere zonal wind speed contour, uh, contour show climatology from four different models, including CSRO, uh, and the end of century response to RCP 8.5. These all these models all have small ensembles, so there's some sort of statistical sig significance for the. Um, I said I shouldn't use that term, but if you're comparing different models with the same initial conditions, it's a reasonable concept. And so these are all uh, robust changes for each model, but you can see every model gives strong changes somewhere, but they differ in sign and location. So clearly if you average over all of Europe, or sorry, average over all the models looking at Europe, you're gonna find that there's not much of a, any change at all, but that's not the expected change. The expected change is, is not zero. So the average of such projections has no meaning, and yet, yet this has direct implications for precipitation and weather related extremes. Oh, so because of such dynamical uncertainty, the uncertainty um, in, the in the precipitation ch changes over many regions stands in contrast to the certainty of, of regional warming. This is a classic IPCC figure uh, style figure, but for, um, for precipitation changes, this is in the, um, uh, in, 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 the, um, in the boreal summer, austral winter. And uh, the, the full stippling is the classic IPCC stippling, where the, which in, indicates the models agree on the sign of change. But we've, in this paper here, we, we introduced an open stippling, which indicates where the models show potentially large but non-robustly projected changes. J just to give an example, Singapore and Sao Paulo are both open stippling. And in the case of Singapore, there's a tendency towards drawing. You, you, you can see on the map here, but the models can, can either give you a range from a lot of drawing to actually uh, a certain amount of wetting. And in Sao Paulo, it's the other way around. The models tend towards a wetting, but they can go from either a lot of wetting or, or even quite a lot of drawing. So you have a, a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but even the regions where there's no, no particular change, um, in, in according to this metric that we use, like uh, Brisbane here, you can see this is compared to the standard deviation uh, interannual. This is a pretty large change. But the open uh, stippling, of course, is the most se se serious kind of uncertainty, and it includes many tropical regions. Um, and in, in, in most extreme events, the role of unusual the dynamical co uh, conditions is, is generally a very important causal factor. This is from a paper led by Yun Paul Lim from, from the Bureau. Um, year ago that came out that was a, looking at the 2019 Australian wildfire season. So the, I just said that a dynamical conditions, how they could change is a major source of uncertainty in climate information for adaptation. And in this analysis, using multiple linear regression is part of it. There was much else in this paper, but uh, in this analysis shown here, it was using MLR to um, partition the, the contributing factors to the increase in the fire risk index. This is an operational fire 
their skin decks uh, used in Australia, uh, I understand. And you can see that the long-term warming trend was actually a pretty small contributor to, to the increased fire risk. And it mainly came from drying and some wind, wind uh, windiness uh, associated with unusual uh, dynamical states from the Pacific sea surface temperatures, the Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures, and the stratospheric vortex. So how those might change actually could have a tremendous impact on the, uh, on the fire risk. So here, here's an example with my, my co-lead of the My Climate Risk Lighthouse Activity, Virginia Rod Rodriguez. We have a perspective uh, coming out in the, in the new journal PNAS Nexus uh, shortly. And in this case study uh, example, we talk about a compound extreme event in Southeast of Brazil, where she's from. And uh, the, 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 the upper left here shows the climatological precipitation uh, during, during, the, um, during the austral summer, you get the South American monsoon, which brings the moisture uh, off the Amazon and is very important for this region of uh, Brazil. But in, in this um, uh, summer of 2013, 2014, that there was an anomalous uh, anticyclonic circulation, which blocked that flow of moisture, led to drying over, over land and uh, actually uh, la lack of cloudiness as well, which led to heat waves, uh, both in the ocean and, and on land. So you've got uh, this te temperature and wind anomaly shown in the upper right. This led to uh, drying out of, of the reservoirs and, and of agricultural lands and marine heat waves. So they've got lots of compound effects. This is a classic food, water, energy nexus um, correlated risk. Uh, there was a probabilistic attribution study of the event. This is the, the traditional approach to single event attribution and they, by Martins et al. in BAMS, and they found that there was insufficient evidence to use their words that climate change increased drought risk. Here was the summary figure from, from their paper. This is a drought risk ratio relative to pre-industrial. So greater than one means that Climate change has increased the drought risk. Less than one means it's de decreased the drought risk. This is a log scale. You can see that the observations indicate a, a tendency towards increased drought risk, but with large uh, uh, uncertainties. The, the CMIP-5 models, for what they're worth, also uh, to, uh, imply increased drought risk, but the two variants of the Met Office model that they ran um, uh, had a decreased drought risk. So they combined all the error bars and got straddling one and said that there was insufficient evidence to reject the null hypothesis. But we can ask insufficient for whom? If you were a water resource manager, I think you would have cause to concern in, in light of the uh, observations and other evidence that there, that there could be increasing drought risk. So if you consider all the uncertainties in climate change in the, in the traditional way, you wind up with what's been dubbed the cascade of uncertainty, which obscures the climate information content, and we have to find a way to, to navigate this. So scientists are pressured to issue single definitive statements. We find that in IPCC, for, for example, the, the statements are all crafted to be single statements. Um, but it's, it's clear that uh, we, if we have a lot of uncertainty, you need a language for expressing a plural conditional state of knowledge. This is just a, uh, a sketch from a, a, a book on decision-making under deep uncertainty that talks about the various levels of, of uncertainty from a clear enough future uh, with a central estimate with some, with some uh, uh, uncertainties to a, a probability to our, uh, alternative futures with, with ranking and so on. So the storylines approach, which I'll talk about, comes really in, I suppose, levels three and four here. There are many decision-making me methods that deal with deep uncertainty. I don't work in that specifically, but I'm certainly aware of that. So there's no need to be probabilistic. Um, there are many methods that uh, deal with, uh, with different kinds of, uh, of approaches. Now, we actually have a huge amount of climate information, even sometimes, if not more so, at, at the local scale from both observations and modeling. The key thing is just that the information is co conditional. So here, here's an example from a very famous event, uh, the summer 2003 heat wave in central France. This, these uh, images are of, of a, a patch in the middle of uh, France shown here in the, upper, in the um, inset here. And there's a scale in the lower uh, right here, 500 meters. So these are about three, three kilometers square. The left column shows one day in August of 2000 with no heat wave, and the right shows um, 10th of August to 2003 during the heat wave. The upper panel shows a vegetation map, and uh, the red uh, is where it's living vegetation, and the green is where, where the vegetation has died. 
you can see that during the heat wave, the, the forest is still there on the right here. You can also see some hedgerows, but all the pastures and grasslands have died out. If you look at the bottom you panels, you get the surface temperature. Now you might say, how can you compare sur surface temperature on one day with, uh, of one year with surface temperature of another day in another year? After all, you've got weather variability. And that's certainly true. You can't compare the left and the right panels directly because of noise. But what you can do is you compare the contrast across the, the, the scenes, which is a much too small scale to be driven by synoptic variability. And you can see that the right-hand panel is, is warmer than, than, than the left-hand panel by uh, uh, 11 degrees C in the forested areas, but 20 degrees C where, where the vegetation um, died out. And they can even pick out the effect of the, of the hedgerows in this, in this image. So we may not be able to predict the statistics of heat waves in the future, but we can predict the implications on how to manage their, their impacts. Ultimately, every extreme event is unique and this uniqueness matters for, for impacts. Uh, a famous event uh, um, was Hurricane Sandy, which hit New York City in, in, in 2012. It was a pretty typical hurricane for most of its life, but then it did a rapid westward steering and it merged with an extra tropical storm and created a superstorm. Both were the result of a strongly deformed jet stream. It was such a freak event that the US weather forecasters didn't even have a protocol for handling such event. And there was confusion in New York City for about 24 hours because there was no handoff between the, the National Hurricane Center and the National Weather Center, the um, National Weather Service, because the, uh, the, uh, the storm was predicted to not be a hurricane technically uh, before landfall. So it seems almost meaningless to ask if such a freak event would, would become more likely in the future. But we do know the sea level will be higher and storms will hold more moisture. So we can legitimately ask and plausibly answer, I'd say, the counterfactual questions, how much were the impacts of Sandy increased by climate change and how much worse might they be in the future? Now, the, our, our, our standard of practice is, of course, uh, t um, a, a, a pretty much enshrined by the, by the IPCC. And if you look at the Good Practice Guidance paper on detection and attrib attribution from 2010, which is still the working guidance paper, these two um, statements jump out at me. Uh, the first was to avoid a selection bias. It is vital that the data is not pre-selected based on observed responses, but instead chosen to represent um, regions and so on where, where, where responses are expected. So we shouldn't look at the observations. We should, we, we should look at models. And secondly, confounding factors should be explicitly identified and evaluated where, where possible. So Adam Sobel and I have argued that these two um, to guidelines, which are perfectly orthodox from a scientific point of view, work against any consideration of the local, local being in space or time or in the phase space of possibilities. And the uh, science and technology scholar Sh Sheila Jasanov has argued that this process of abstraction and generalization in mainstream climate science de detaches knowledge from meaning, which is a phrase I find very, very powerful. Now, I was, um, as part of a My Climate Risk activity uh, um, uh, a few months ago, I was part of a workshop uh, uh, from ISIMOD based in Nepal, and uh, Dr. Santosh Nepal, a hydrologist, uh, talked about there, when he talks to the farmers, they say, we believe what we see and not what we're told. But these IPCC guidelines are saying we should believe what we're told, not what we see. So you can see we have a mismatch between what people are feeling are sensing in the field and what, how, how we operate as scientists. Now, rather than being a confounding effect for the effects of climate change, the urban heat island effect, for example, is a threat multiplier. So we shouldn't try to avoid it, we should try to deal with it. But again, the spatial dependence is predictable. We have conditional information. This is an image from uh, a gray literature report in The Hague in the Netherlands after a heat wave. And you can see that the, the, that the temperature map, um, and they uh, shown here that this, the scale isn't very, uh, um, it, it's typical great literature scale, but um, they compared that with, with the different neighborhoods and not surprisingly, the poor neighborhoods were disproportionately affected. And the, uh, the regions closer to, to the English, to, to the North Sea, which have re received all the, all the, all the green funds, um, are the rich neighborhoods and they don't suffer as badly. So this, of course, is a very telling image. 
Now, if we talk, think about uncertainty, there's, uh, it's worth thinking about some of the fundamentals of probability, and I won't get into that much here, but hopefully you know that, um, that the probability, uh, that the joint probability of, 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 two, of two variables, let's call them E and C, is equal to the product of the conditional probability, probability V given C times the probability of C. That's just the fundamental rule of probability. And so you can construct a risk or ratio, a likelihood, a ratio of the probabilities of, let's say, the future probabilities, P1, let's say, and P0 could be present day. And, uh, and um, E could be the event of interest, like a heat wave or, or drought or something, and C is the circulation regime conducive to, to that event. And in the US National Academy's report on extreme event attribution that I was part of five years ago, this, this equation was, was, uh, was written down. It's a very simple equation. It's trivial from a mathematical point of view, but I think it's very profound from an interpretational point of view because you can see that the rate ratio of probabilities factorizes into a product of two ratios. The first ratio here is a ratio of conditional probabilities. That represents the effects of climate change for a given circulation regime. It's like the question I asked about Hurricane Sandy. That builds in what we know with confidence about climate change because it does relate to the thermodynamic aspects is sometimes called the thermodynamic component of change. Now, um, uh, the, you can define this in, in, in various ways and, and the distinction between dynamics and th thermodynamics is certainly not precise, but it's very useful. The second ratio is the, ratio, is the change in the circulation itself, sometimes called the dynamical component of change and I've argued that should be treated separately, but, for example, by storylines because of the epistemic, uh, um, uh, deep epistemic uncertainty in that term. And the advantages is built in self-consistency, which is essential for correlated risk. So that led, led to the concept of storylines and with a, with, with a group at a workshop, uh, we, 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 we published this paper a few years ago and um, uh, it, it introduced the definition for the physical climate system of a physically based unfolding of past weather or climate events or future events or pathways. This definition is now incorporated in the IPCC glossary, and there's a box on storylines in the chapter six, uh, sorry, chapter 10 of the Working Group One report. It was, um, we, we talked about this uh, unforecasted rain on snow event in the Swiss Alps. I won't go into this in detail. For this talk, I'm going to focus on the first, the upper left panel here, which talks about the, the way that. Um, that you can use uh, storylines to uh, provide a physical basis for, for partitioning uncertainty. In this particular event, uh, a low front, uh, a cold front came through first. This was a, a, in the autumn, uh, dumped a meter of snow in the Alps, and then a warm front came through and there was an atmospheric river tucked behind it. It melted the snow or rained on the snow and led to this catastrophic um, landslide and, and uh, flooding. But there were other uh, topologies of use of storylines, exploring the boundaries of plausibility, improving risk awareness, and strengthening the, the decision making, which I won't have time to go into here, but you can read about in the paper. Now, as I said, storylines are like a narrative, and uh, the f famous evolutionary bi biologist Stephen Jay Gould wrote here natural historians have too often been apologetic, but most emphatically should not be in supporting a plura plurality of legitimately scientific modes, including a narrative or historical style that explicitly links the explanation of outcomes, not only to spatio-temporally invariant laws of nature, which is what we try to do as physicists, but also, if not pr pr primarily, to, to the specific con contingencies of antecedent of states, which if constituted differently could not have generated the observed results. So sorry for the, um, it's very uh, thick language here, but it's very meaningful language. And so uh, you can ask why not climate scientists too? Uh, after all, climate science is a natural science. So with uh, Lisa Lloyd, a philosopher of science I've been collaborating with, we, we, we've written several papers now. This is one also out of an inter interdisciplinary workshop uh, published in a climatic change where we talk about the, the link with narratives. This image to me speaks um, loudly. This was a flood, a, a disaster in, in Nepal uh, um, uh, last boreal summer. This is an image for, for, from space. You can see the scale here. 
And this is in the valley, um, Malamchi here, there's a, a agricultural area and there was a heavy rain which led to landslides and debris outflow. And the whole valley was inundated with debris, stones um, knee deep. This valley is not, this agricultural land is not coming back. So this is an irreversible event. So, so the, there's a story behind that event. Now, but the course of the danger with stories is how do we ensure that stories or storylines are not ju just so stories as Kipling argued? So the answer lies in probability theory and the logic of Bayesian, Bayesian reasoning. And the, um, uh, in, in that paper, climatic change paper in, in the autumn, I have many quotations from Harold Jeffrey's theory of probability. Jeffries was a geophysicist and actually atmospheric uh, 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 a dynamist, but wrote this famous book on probability, and there's some real gems in there. This one, he says, we get no evidence for our hypothesis by merely working out its consequences and showing that they agree with some observations, because it may happen that a wide range of other hypotheses agree with those observations equally well. To get evidence, we must examine its various contradictories and show that they do not fit the observations. So that's the answer to this, to this query. So I'll talk about another example of from, from Canada, where I'm from originally, uh, an Arctic e ecosystem uh, collapsed from a saltwater storm surge in, in the Mackenzie Delta. And it, it changed the, um, the, uh, the ecosystem from freshwater species shown in, in green in the image here, the brackish species shown in red. There are lake sediments at this site here, D DZO 29 going back a thousand years, which show that the that with this is a zoom on the last 10 years, you can see that that event was un, unprecedented in the thousand year record. So again, you have a singular event, which is best described through a narrative or a storyline, uh, I, I, I would argue. So storylines are essentially conditional explanations, if this, then that, and they can be represented in causal networks. Uh, so this is an example of a causal network in the, in the paper uh, talking about the, the, this event, it didn't um, produce a causal network. This is what we've done in this paper with Lisa uh, in two, uh, 2000, talking about a number of ecosystem events. But in, in the Pasarik et al. paper, they, they, they discuss all these different factors, pride, coastal retreat, and so on. And they conclude that the, the, really the, the essential ones were the longer open water season, which has come from climate change, from decreasing Arctic sea ice, and the Arctic storm. And the Arctic storm could be a chance, could be treated as a chance event, or it could be, if you believe you, you have the evidence treat, treated as having increased likelihood from climate change. But there's no assessment of statistical significance or likelihood. And in this paper, Lisa and I argue that the storyline approach aligns very well with the forensic approach to attribution that you find in the ecosystem literature. And also, as it happens, it relates well to li liability under tort law. And we, we show that in a, a different paper. So I think it's a very flexible uh, approach of representing evidence. So just to talk about a couple of uh, types of storylines, uh, the one is what you would call what, what you might call an, an event storyline. This is actually taken from the um, from this box in chapter ten of the AR six report. So we can think of things very. Uh, 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 schem uh, schematically is working from the left to the right. We have greenhouse gas emissions that combines with climate sensitivity to yield a global warming level. Then that will lead to regional warming, um, which are quite well uh, understood patterns, but also remote drivers like El Nino or the stratospheric polar vortex that I talked about already. Um, those give rise to, to, to the dynamical uh, conditions such as a blocking event or, or, or a storm or something like that. Those together yield a hazard, and that together with vulnerability and exposure gives you impact. So if you condition or specify the, the dynamical conditions, like a storm or, and the regional warming pattern, then you get a storyline of a particular event. And then you blocked all these other factors, which, are, which don't, don't have to be specified. So an example of that, you, you can do this various ways. You can do it statistically or, or through models. This is with a PhD student of mine at at the University of Hamburg, Linda Van Garderen. Um, uh, which, so what she's been doing is, is, is running a global atmospheric model, um, which is nudged to, re, to reanalysis conditions. So in, the, in this case, you, you constrain it with the warmer ocean temperatures and in, increased greenhouse gases, which fill in the physics. 
It's actually um, a, a method used in regional climate modeling for over 20 years, known as the pseudo global warming method. Um, the advantage is it allows the, the use of weather resolving atmospheric models that can follow uh, complex events like blocking, which the, which the free running models struggle with, and it's physically self consistent. You achieve very high signal noise ratio in both space and time. This is for the Russian heat wave of 2010. The other kind of storyline which has been used uh, um, uh, up to now is what, what the IPCC called a, a dynamical storyline, or you might call it a circulation drivers storyline. So in this case, you step a little bit, bit back up through, uh, through the chain here, and you specify the global warming level, like two, two degrees or so, something, and remote drivers like ENSO, let's say. And then you block the climate sensitivity. So the, in this framing, the climate sensitivity isn't affecting the, the impacts because you've conditioned on the global warming level, but if but it affects the carbon budget, which I think makes a lot of sense. Um, so an example, uh, Julia Midland, who's another student of mine at a remote place, in this case, Buenos Aires, and she's spoken to the Bureau uh, actually at the workshop that, that you had recently. She's been applying this to the Southern Hemisphere, and this is the uh, Australian sector and New Zealand, I should say. Um, uh, this is the change in winter precipitation per, per degree of warming. So, so the units are millimeters per day per, uh, per degree of warming. Um, and this, uh, she had identified two drivers that, that were relevant uh, in this region. The tropical, this is the upper tropospheric amplification of tropical warming, which could be either low or high and then whether the stratosphere vortex breakdown was early or late. And depending on how these play out, you see you get very different uh, precipitation changes over Australia and New Zealand. Um, in principle, any one of these might be true. So you could use these four storylines to interpret the observed changes and articulate multiple causal hypotheses. Now, in this case, it was based on the CMIP-5 ensemble. It's very similar in CMIP-6. So this shows the different models in terms of the re re response, again, per, per degree of warming, of global warming, of the tropical warming or the vortex breakdown delay. And the storylines are in these red dots. So you see they basically span the range. So if you are comfortable in interpreting SEMA 5 uh, probabilistically, then you can interpret the storylines probabilistically. You, you could just assign 25% probability to, to each of them. But of course, you can do better if you want, and you can certainly refine in the future based on new knowledge, for example, maybe eliminate one of the storylines as implausible. Now, the reason why storylines are important, this is from the paper with Giuseppe Zappa, where we did where we applied this to the Mediterranean. If you take a traditional view and you ask, what's the difference um, of Mediterranean drying, which is a major climate risk uh, of one degree C versus two degrees C. And so the, the, the contours show the drying uh, in units here of millimeters per, per day. And the horizontal axis is the global warming level. The vertical is what we call a storyline uh, index. Um, and you can see that you would say that the, the, uh, the difference um, is either is, is between 0.03 to 0.15 millimeters per day at 1.5 C or 0.05 to 0.2 at two degrees C. And if you just naively compared those, you would say that the, the difference is small compared to the uncertainty or indistinguishable using a classical uh, or frequentist kind of interpretation. But the storyline view would, would, would say, well, of course, we're on one storyline or we can't switch storylines. So it makes sense to compare storyline by storyline. And the differences then uh, uh, are distinguishable for any storyline. And the key is the conditionality of, of the representation. Uh, finally, um, as I say, I haven't worked on decision um, um, uh, a perspective yet, although I'm certainly keen to get uh, involved in it. And it's interesting that uh, um, there are various um, methods called de uh, de decision trees and so on that fit very naturally into causal networks. <coughs> this textbook by Fenton and Neil talks a lot about this and um, risk assessment and, and decision analysis with lots of examples of causal networks. Uh, and uh, in this case, this shows the a case of a dam burst and, and the consequent um, uh, 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 consequences um, from two uh, perspectives, the local authority or the household. So from a local authority a perspective, you have the dam burst, that'll create a flood, that creates a loss of life, and you can um, 
there's a control which is which which affects what we would call exposure which is a flood barrier and then a mitigant which which we we would uh, say affects a vulnerability in our language which uh, which is through the emergency response but from a household perspective the control are the sandbags which affect the house flood and the insurance is affects the vulnerability which affects loss of capital so again it's a very flexible method which can be linked to linked to causal networks and therefore storylines um, finally though i want to make some uh, points about about ethics um, i would say because uh, the, the, i think we have to invert the construction uh, as sagata said in my my climate risk we're trying to take a bottom-up approach and that requires inverting how we can construct climate information in this famous paper uh the the post-normal science paper by Funtovitz and Rabbits, I'm sorry. Um, in 93, they have this quote that really struck me. We often think of, of science as being hard and, and, and we have hard facts and from our science and then we have the values are uh, a social science-y thing, which are soft, but they argue it, it, it's inverted. It's, it's the science that becomes soft in the context of the hard value commitments that will determine the success of policies for mitigating the effects of climate change. And I think that's all too true. Now, I've been very, very struck by uh, Schumacher's uh, famous book, Small is Beautiful from 73. And uh, Schumacher argues that we should derive the, our conceptual frameworks from reality rather than deriving reality from a conceptual framework. And the key is to make it intelligible and to keep it simple. And he says, uh, when a thing is intelligible, you have a sense of, of participation. When a thing is unintelligible, you have a sense of uh, estrangement. And he, and he also says, it is rather more difficult to recapture directness and simplicity than to advance in the direction of ever more sophistication and complexity. And in this paper with Regina, we, uh, we take a lot of uh, the qu quotations from Schumacher and interpret them in the context of climate change science and find that, that they really resonate. So finally, let me just say that to address adaptation, we, we need to navigate the ca cascade of uncertainty uh, and connect to the decision space. The relevant question is not what will happen. Of course, if we knew that, that would be great, but, it, but, but, but we don't. But that isn't the relevant question anyway. The relevant question is what is the impact of particular actions under an uncertain regional climate change that reframes the question. We need to find a scientific language for, for, for describing the plural conditional state of, of knowledge that exists at the regional and the local scales and resist aggregation, which, uh, which de destroys information. And the storyline approach to regional climate information does exactly this. So uh, moreover, l l linking to historical events in their proper context brings a salience to, to, to the risk. And this is well understood psych psychologically. Um, one of the things I particularly like is that storylines provide a built-in, not a contrived narrative. We need narratives, but if they're bolted on at the end, they can be contrived. This way, they're, they're built in, and that gives an emotional element, which is also has been shown to be essential for the decision-making. So, uh, And finally, we need to explore storylines story of climate risk, combining the best information from, from all sources, interpreted not as a prediction, but as representing plausible futures. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ted. That was really interesting and um, thought-provoking. Um, Wait to see if there are any questions popping up in the chat. I think people are sort of focusing to try and take in all that information. It was a lot of information in a short time. Um, while people are sort of for formulating their questions, maybe I'll take the liberty and, and uh, ask a question if that's all right. Um, I was wondering about, um, there's, also, there's also a lot of talk in, um, in attribution circles about storylines now, and, I, and obviously you touched on it a little bit, and it's a good fit, um, especially in place where we have uh, limited knowledge of the dynamics, I guess, of how you know regional circulation will change. How how do we go about um, connecting the language of attribution science with the language of climate change storylines? I guess because you know to go from um, things like fractional trivial risk and um, risk ratios, you know, inherently the language is about risk. Uh, and in storylines, I guess, we're talking about um, narratives. C can you say something on that? Do you have, you know, do you have thoughts on that? Sorry, I don't, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I'm sure you Yeah, 
Um, and by by the way, there, there is a question in the Q and A from Michael Gross, but let me pick pick this. Um, well, yeah, and actually, there's uh, there's deep problems with fraction of uh, 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 of attributable risk, uh, which I can't go into, but it's a fundamentally flawed concept, and that's it's really really dangerous. And it's been pointed out that uh, it would really overestimate climate risk because the analogy with epidemiology is just completely wrong. I mean, you either you you get get sick or you don't. But it, but if you ha have a storm, it could be weaker, it could be stronger. So I think there's a lot of problems with the with the frequentist approach. But I think if we think of attribution from, let's say, a weather forecasting or a seasonal forecasting point of view, you think of all the different causal processes. And I think one of the problems with the, I find with the so-called probabilistic approach to uh, event attribution is the only cause that's talked about is climate change. And the, you just establish that by comparing model runs with and without climate change or, or, or trying to regress out climate change statistically or something like that. But there's many causal factors uh, in any event. And, um, and as I say, because of the uncertainty about how ENSO is gonna change, if ENSO is a strong causal factor, you should pull it out separately and think about different, different hypotheses. And I think that's where storylines can help because um, you don't have a definitive unconditional attribution, you have conditional attributions, but depending on your storyline of how, how ENSO might change, that has very different implications for future risk. So I think, um, I mean, risk has a much more, it's, it's not just, uh, you know, a probability thing. If, if you Google it or you talk to somebody, risk just means the, uh, the possibility of something bad happening. So we also need, I think, a more flexible language about risk. Thanks, Ted. Um, plenty of questions rolling in now. Uh, we'll start with Michael at the top. Um, really important deep points, Ted. A lot of climate change projections work is done with CMIP models. Oops. Oh, that just disappeared. Go? What happened there? Uh, hang on. I, I oh, found it. Dismissed. Um, <laughs> Can you a lot find of climate it? change projections work is done with CMIP models and then regional modeling from that under the SSPs and is used in a frequentist framework while acknowledging it is an ensemble of opportunity. How would you design a better modeling program to suit storylines and Bayesian approaches if you had top-down control or is one big framework less useful here? Uh, well, I don't believe in one big framework. I definitely believe in d diversity uh, uh, of approaches and storylines are not the answer to everything. I mean everything we do any, anyone who does any kind of scientific uh, analysis knows that there's always a trade-off and you have to make a, make a trade-off so storylines are making certain trade-offs and i would never argue that they're you know the be-all and end-all i do think that we have to make much better use of, of our models and you shouldn't just pool everything it seems to me because then you're 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 uh conflating uh, internal variability and, and uh, systematic variability. I mean, no measurement scientist would ever confuse systematic error with random error. And yet we do that all the time by making these ensembles of opportunities. So I think what we have to do is bring together different lines of evidence from the large ensembles of, of initial condition runs where it is, it is internal variability, um, very high resolution models, which are providing very detailed information, but <laughs> highly conditional because they're going to run only a very limited sample. So I think Bayesian approaches, at least in some light form, I'm not sure we have to go full on Bayesian necessarily, but we can articulate different. So storylines are just hypotheses. They're just scientific hypotheses. And you can evaluate quantitatively the, uh, the evidence behind different storylines through something called a base factor, which is actually just p-values. It's a ratio of p-values. So it's still using some of the tools that we're comfortable with or we know about, but in a more physically based uh, uh, framework. Thanks, Ted. Um, I'll go to the next question from Julie R. Blaster. Thanks, Ted, for a fascinating talk. Could you expand a little on how you decide slash deduce which storylines are important to the yeah. impact you are focused on? That's a really interesting question. I really yeah. like it. Well, if I, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm, I'm slowly getting in, into working with a, a, a decision um, in the decision community, but I'm, I'm doing it gradually with, you know, trust, trusted partners. But I would say my first answer is just talk, talk to the user who probably has a good sense. So, for example, I have a PhD student working on drug risk in UK. You might be surprised, but southern UK is, is very prone to drought because of the, of the, of the water demand.
and they're very conscious of uh, you know historic droughts, which are benchmarks for for the water industry. So they tell us we 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 have to look at these historic droughts and have storylines. You know how um, how much worse could the seventy six drought have been, and that kind of thing. So I, I suspect as soon as you talk to a real user, they're going to have some knowledge based on their you know, operational knowledge, their traditional knowledge, whatever, of what kind of risks that they're likely to face, and that will target the, the storyline. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, something something that a lot of us are thinking about in the um, in the community where we're sort of trying to provide climate change services or develop climate change services is exactly that question. How do you base these storylines story lines around decision-making processes? Um, Question from Lyndon Ashcroft. Do you think there are other fields of science or research in general that have successfully harnessed the power of storylines? It sounds like climate research is a bit far behind the eight ball here, perhaps because we have been trained to hide behind statistics and hard science, lest we be seen as too emotional. That's a really interesting question. It's a very good, good question. And I think the emotional one is kind of a tricky one, isn't it? Um, uh, so in the, uh, I'll just point you to the paper, the Shepard and Lloyd paper in Climate Exchange. You can get all these from my website. They're all open access. Um, where we talk, I gave the example of a narrative in science and, and a quote from St Stephen J. J. Gould. So uh, we actually talk, uh, we have a whole section on the narrative in, in science, and it's certainly much more prominent in um, ev uh, uh, um, uh, evolution, for, for, for example, evolutionary bi biology and and so I think that's that that's an area where where there has been more, um, and but of course there was a tradition in in, in climatology as well of of historical climatology people like Hubert Lamb and so on. Um, so I think that there there was more of that in the past in climate science, and it's been somewhat lost. In fact, Debbie Cohen, a historian at Yale, has written about um, some very interesting uh, books. Um, on the way climate was dealt with in the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire and so on, uh, for, to bring an emotional, to bring a unity to the uh, Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, so there's, yeah, there's, it's, it, we could do more with that, but it, it's certainly, but evolution of biology is the, is the obvious thing and ecosystem uh, science as well, I agree. Great, thanks. Um, Question from Dietmar Domenger. Um, how do you deal with CMIP black box projections that have a clear signal, but no storyline brackets, no physical understanding of why? Well, uh, um, you know, uh, it, I guess may, maybe it'd be good, a good, good to ha ha have an example. I mean, are there any, is there anything that the models all agree on that we don't uh, uh, understand? The one thing I'm conscious of, and maybe someone here can and enlighten me, is that for some reason between CMIP five and CMIP six, all the models got very confident about precipitation changes in East Africa and South Asia, for reasons that I don't understand. And I've talked to, to people, a few people, they all know exactly why, but everyone has a different explanation, which to me means that we 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 don't know. That might be who who knows something about the aerosol cloud interactions, even for that matter. So I, I'm not really sure if there is an, if uh, if there really is an example. Well, I guess you could say storm track shifts or something like that, maybe because there are lots of different theories of that. I think if all the models are giving a a, a similar um, signal, and we don't think it's just because of common code sharing, you know, the fact that everybody changed their cloud scheme at the same time, then it's it it, it is sort of a storyline, but it's pending pending explanation. You know, it's a hypothesis that needs to be uh, explored. So I think it, I, I, um, I, I wouldn't want to get too um, picky about a definition uh, of a storyline. If it's, if, it's if it's a hypothesis that is, that, that is not ignorable, then you should think about it. But, uh, um, you know, it, it, it doesn't have to be fully understood, I suppose. It's a working hypothesis, you, you, you would call it that. Thanks, Ted. Tiny, Ted, we've, we've, we've reached the one hour mark. Um, do you have a couple more minutes to answer sure. some questions? Yeah, we, yeah I'm happy to stay on. We've got, we've got, we've got some, some more questions, don't we? There's a, there's a heap more, um, at least four or five, um, but we can stop whenever you, you feel. All right. I'm still going strong. I ha, ha, have my double espresso, so I'm, uh, 
Um, I'm really interested in the answer to this question. You answered this question, Ted, um, from Shane Keating. Great talk. Thanks, Ted. How do you retain scientific ob objectivity with a storyline approach? And how do you avoid the charge of cherry picking certain climate scenarios? Yeah. I think it's really. I, it's a very important question. And I think, uh, I mean, the first thing, though, is to push back that uh, so called uh, objective methods are not objective. There is no such thing as uh, objectivity in, in science. And there's, there's a lot of, there's growing a literature on that with, uh, from a philosophers of science and so on. Um, you know, the frequentist uh, uh, approaches um, claim to be objective or appear to be uh, 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 objective, but they do, there's always a framing involved in which variables that you look at, which models you've included, which data sets you've included, which you haven't. They're basically, uh, I would say it's either, you either bury everything uh, 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 under the carpet, or you lobotomize <laughs> yourself and throw away all, all, all your knowledge. And neither of those are good things. So if if objectivity means that, then I, I don't want it. And it's better to be to put everything on the table. And what's more important, I mean, uh, objectivity, I find is actually a very hard thing to, def it's always a self referential term, I feel much more important is tra transparency. And uh, and putting everything out in front. So I think, you know, su subjectivity is, 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 is normal and we just have to be uh, clear about things. In terms of cherry picking, uh, I, I gave part of the answer was I think this, that you have to look at multiple storylines and articulate that, you know, you don't just give one storyline, you give multiple storylines and you look at the evidence behind each of them. And you also look at the, at the effect that they would have. So, you know, if, if a, if a user is concerned about a particular impact, that's not cherry picking, that's, that's, their, that's their vulnerability. So, you know, the idea of ch cherry picking, you're, you're allowed to cherry pick. You know, the other thing, uh, proof by con uh, contradiction is the most elegant form of math uh, mathematical proof, it's cherry picking. There's nothing wrong with cherry picking. It's what's wrong is to cherry pick and not acknowledge it. Thanks, Ted. Yeah, that's a it's a really interesting one, and I think this is it, it relates to the next question as well. But um, just just on this, I think the connection between um, sort of the physical science that we think about and the decision making process or the impact of interest to whoever we're doing the science to inform that's sort of you know just plan, spanning the plausible range of impacts. That's kind of at least in my mind where, where I think we're trying to get mm. to. Um, but connected to that, this question from Steve Sherwood. Hi, Ted, lots of great ideas. I see a conflict between not wanting to aggregate and the high dimensionality of dynamical conditions. The, for example, the New York Transit manager may only, um, may only care about does the subway flood, not about all the different ways the atmospheric circulation might have brought that about. Any comment? How do you deal with the high dimensionality of, of dynamical space to get to what people care about? Um, yeah, well, I think, I mean, I, I think aggregating, uh, is dangerous if you're aggregating over lots of different things and you don't really know how uncertain e e each of them is. So I think I think that's one of them. I think we, uh, I mean, everybody's saying that we have to d disaggregate and I think that's absolutely clear. Now, okay, how, how do you find how many d d different pathways? Um, I think that, you know, some mathematicians will uh, tell me that uh, for certain kinds of things you can find, um, you know, uh, particular pathways. If so, sometimes there are structures like a blocking event where there's a there's a particular kind of a pathway. So there is actually an area called for rare, rare event simulation, which comes out of the theoretical physics. And uh, there's uh, a group um, um, mainly based in France that's been applying this to to heat, heat waves and so on. So it, it and the idea is that you basically um, it's called importance sampling. You basically throw away a, a trajectories which are not uh, developing in an interesting way and you clone ones and, and you know, cluster all, all your computing power around one, um, ones that are, uh, are risky. So I, I don't know how many, you know, there's, there may only be three or four different ways of, of getting uh, a, a serious event. If there really are lots and lots and lots, I, I, I don't know. But I think in most cases, there will be certain pathways and, and for, forecasters know about those. But I think we can do better. We, there are... Um, better methods that we should try to ha 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 harness to find those ways. You know, I mean, in a forecasting context, you would use singular vectors or something like that, but I think we can try to find a a analogous things in climate. 
Um, Thanks, Ted. Um, do you have time for one more? Yeah. Is, yeah. is that all right? Okay. Um, from Ramona Del Pozza, agree that past events give a good indication of the climate risks and impacts that are likely to get worse in the future. Unfortunately, we struggle to get people to accept this. Can you suggest a way to use storylines to do this better? Wow. Um, I mean, the usual argument is, is that it's, it, pe people um, deal with historical events much better than they deal with things that haven't happened but could happen. It's true that memories are short. Uh, I don't know there's any scientific answer to that. I think storylines um, uh, re re relate to people's memories and historical events. I mean, people, gosh, people here still talk about the 1987 storm and so on that brought down a lot of trees, um, uh, uh, huge trees. Uh, I, uh, yeah, I don't, I'm so, I, I guess I'm not, I'm not working enough in the areas, but uh, to, to know that, but um, um, uh, I, I think it's our best chance. And actually the criticism, and it's, it's uh, a, a legitimate one, is that if we only worry about past events, then we might, miss events that could, could have happened but didn't and that's certainly true but at least let's get people to think a lever off of the events that have happened because there is a rich uh you know a lot of i think a lot of industry use has benchmark events that are used and it's a pretty standard practice and until we are resilient against those you know then we can think about events that we ha haven't imagined yet um Okay, thanks, Ted. Look, we've gone seven minutes past. Um, Tani, is, do we have a way to pass these questions on to Ted so that he can um, have an email correspondence with anyone or, or should we just keep going? What, what do you guys prefer? Well, if, I mean, we can do it either way. I can stay up a bit. Uh, I don't know how much, uh, how many do we have? We've got about... Uh, we've probably got some about... Of that some yeah. of them are just comments too. Um, I mean, Michael has said that historical analogs are a useful tool, spatial analogs. So there's various. Okay. Uh, well, this, uh, could we take a, maybe five more? To, yeah. if that's all right. All right. I yeah. think that'll cover the actual questions. The rest are just uh, yeah. comments. Yeah. Um, from Nina Ritter, do you see value in a storyline testing whether a worst case scenario stressing one particular system, e.g. emergency services to breaking point is physically possible? Well, I would think so. It'll depend on the kind of modeling that that is that that is available. And by modeling, I don't just mean you know physical modeling. It could be statistical, but I guess it'll it'll very much depend on the context. But we do have models, and it is a stress. You know, in the financial sector, people use stress tests. It's a very uh, accepted concept. So I think the same thing uh, hap can happen in many ways. I think that people um, a lot of emergency services deal with. Um, um, plausible worst case scenarios. I have I've a, a, a colleague here, Nigel Arnold, who was seconded to the cabinet office for a while in the UK, and they're asking all the time about plausible worst case scenarios. That's a very standard concept. Now, I think in climate science, we would, you know, people say, well, what, what does plausible mean? Define it, you know, but it's a very natural language and it's a, it, it's a stress testing kind of approach. So I think I, I, absolutely. Okay, question from Adrian Little. Flipping the question, is there also a risk for decision makers to seek hard numbers to remove the discomfort of uncertainty? So hard numbers can give a disservice out of context of the local. Oh, absolutely. Well, don't we all experience that with performance metrics and various stuff like that? I mean, making everything quantitative just takes the judgment out of things and uh, gets people off the hook. And absolutely, it's a terrible thing. I mean, um, you know, we need narrative. Anyone who's ever written uh, any kind of evaluation knows that it's a combination of uh, quantitative and qualitative. You have some facts, but you have to embed them in a narrative, whether it's a promotion or something like that. So I, I do think, and it's it's you know this is not climate change. This is just our our, our society. Things are getting so automated, um, and it's a very dangerous uh, tendency. I think. Okay, question from Irina Rudeva. Thanks, Ted, for a thought-provoking talk. You focused a lot on the emotional side of the problem. I feel that there are even more storylines in that space. People coming from different cultures have different risk tolerance, for example. Given that there is no single moral, it makes it difficult to put soft values first. Can you expand on this a little bit? 
Well, I would just, yeah, just, just a little, and I, I guess it's, um, I, I don't have a lot of experience, but the thing about, and actually uh, in, once you take a Bayesian approach and you, as I said, you can, um, people, uh, uh, Bayesians define probability in terms of belief typically, um, uh, which we can just interpret as expert knowledge, but you can also define um, probability from a, uh, uh, a decision end and an action end. And uh, Jimmy Sa Savage wrote a famous book on statistics in 1954, I think, where he derived all the axioms of probability from choice, basically. So you can work backwards and you can call it value. I mean, uh, uh, economists would call it utility, which is kind of a, a sanitized term, but you know, utility can mean values. It, can, it, it, it doesn't have to be money. It can be all, all kinds of things. So I think there is a way to bring emotion in and it'll be it'll be uh, a subjective for sure but um uh and i've seen examples of that mimi lamb at Ber bergen has been looking at this actually well she's canadian and she did a study of fisheries and the different values of the industry and indigenous peoples and so on and so you can work she didn't do it bayesian but i mean it's you you you, you can definitely start to come at things from different values and I think there are ways to uh, embed that in this whole framework. Thanks, Ted. Look, this is the last question. I think it's a good one to end on. Can you, um, so from Alan West, Kingston, can you expand on your experience with collaborating with non-science fields, writers, et cetera, to convert a compelling technical storyline into an engaging, effective community oh, educational outcome? I'm not sure I have an experience of that, actually. <laughs> I have been collaborating with, um, you know, philosopher of science, well, it's she, she's not quite a non-scientist because Lisa Lloyd was trained as an evolutionary bi biologist, but, she, but she's a philosopher of science. And I've been working with anthropologists recently as well. So, uh, but it's not, it's not communication. It's with, it's interdisciplinary. Um, I don't have much experience of, uh, of community education, I always say, except that I will just say that um, keeping it simple <laughs> matters. I had the problem in Canada that I was in the same field for a long, long, long time. And my talks got more and more tactical. And when I came to Britain and I sort of switched in, in, into climate change and tropospheric uh, uh, dynamics and started giving talks to audiences, um, very wide ranging groups here, uh, sometimes without slides, it works, it's, it's freeing. <laughs> It's, it's really freeing. So try just trying to keep it simple, I think. Um, but this balance between simplifying, uh, you know, keeping it simple without oversimplifying, it's, it's, it's always a tricky balance, you know, to, uh, to, to, to do that. So. Thank you so much, Ted, and apologies for keeping you so far past the scheduled time. Um, really appreciate you giving this talk and um, lots to think about. Thank you to everyone who dialed in. Um, thank you especially to Tani for her organization of, of this event. Really appreciate all the work you did behind the scenes and also to my um, uh, my organizing committee, which was myself, Andrew King and Michael Gross. Um, thank you very much. So Ted, hope to um, be in touch with you again more and anyone who's interested yep. in the Lighthouse activity um, and the, um, the regional hub, please do get in touch with one of us and we can have more of a conversation and keep this going. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Th Cheers. Thank you for, for the opportunity. Thanks.